Welcome to my video lecture on pneumonia. Today I'm going to be discussing pneumonia from pathophysiology to treatment. So what is pneumonia? Well basically pneumonia is an infection of the lung. So understand that the epithelial surfaces of the lung are exposed every day to liters of contaminated air and nasopharyngeal flora. Your respiratory system is constantly being bombarded by these offenders every day. So why don't you get sick? Well, to mitigate these risk factors, your body has a number of defense mechanisms specifically designed to act as a barrier to infection. At the center of your immune system, of course, is the innate and adaptive immunity. This includes your white blood cells, your antibodies, and complement. But let's also take a closer look at the respiratory specific defenses. In your upper respiratory system, you have nasal hairs. These line the insides of your nostrils and they catch the larger microbes. You have turbinates. And these are bony ridges that form the nasal passageway through the nasal pharynx. These humidify your inhaled air. And also, this air is covered with goblet cells, and these secrete mucus and catch airborne particles as well. And going down to your lower respiratory system, the inner epithelial surface of the bronchi are covered with cilia. And covering the cilia is a double layer of mucus. This serves to trap particulate matter that gets past your nasopharynx. These cilia beat upwards and propel trapped particulate matter towards the larynx, where it's either coughed up or swallowed. This is what's known as the mucociliary apparatus, or sometimes you hear mucociliary escalator. This is what helps to make a productive cough, which is what we want. The thing is, is that this apparatus can be damaged or depressed by smoking, alcohol use, or even pre-existing viral illnesses can cause this to not work as well as it should. So, the development of pneumonia indicates either a defect in these host defenses we just talked about, exposure to a virulent organism or an overwhelming inoculum. So defects in host defenses. Well, what are those? Well, we just talked about a couple of them. Extrinsically defects can be caused by smoking, which paralyzes the action of cilia. Alcohol poses numerous risks for the development of pneumonia, some of which include depression of the gag and cough reflex, which increases risk for aspiration. And what's often associated with alcohol and pneumonia is Klebsiella. That actually brings us to that classic board question, the gentleman, the alcoholic gentleman that presents to the emergency room with cough, he has pneumonia. Klebsiella is often that bacterium that's associated with that situation. So these individuals who are alcoholics, they colonize Klebsiella. And since they're often passed out, they're at greater risk for aspirating it. Virulent organisms. So what is virulence? So when we say virulence, we mean organisms that through evolution have developed mechanisms to overcome or resist host defenses and therefore they're more adept at causing disease. So for instance, Chlamydophila, which is more commonly called chlamydia pneumonia, can paralyze cilia, which degrades that mucociliary escalator we talked about. Mycoplasma, can destroy cilia. 
and strep pneumonia produces proteases that destroy IgA that's secreted by the body. So just understand that with certain pathogens, there are any number of adaptations that they've developed to facilitate their spread. And overwhelming inoculum. And this simply means that many organisms, if inoculated in large enough quantities, can cause disease simply because the immune system isn't capable of handling a large-scale exposure. And keep in mind that any exacerbation to any of the above-mentioned factors can cause an increase in the severity and frequency of illness. For instance, an increase in the degree of host defense insult, such as someone with profound AIDS progression. These individuals are susceptible not only to unusual pathogens, but are at greater risk for serious disease. Or you consider someone with exposure to an extremely virulent organism. So you consider individuals in the hospital for extended stays or anyone who is on ventilator assistance. These individuals are prone to nosocomial infections. These, these infections are often caused by drug-resistant pathogens that have adapted to survive in hospital settings, and they can result in worsened course of illness. So, to give you a quick illustration on how a pneumonia develops, here we have a rough cross-section of the upper respiratory system descending down into the lower respiratory system, from the bronchi all the way down to the alveolus. And here's your capillary. So when a microbe attaches itself to respiratory epithelium, the epithelium has surface receptors that recognize it as foreign and activates inflammatory processes. So a couple of things that the inflammatory response does is that it increases capillary permeability and activates chemotaxis. Now, chemotaxis facilitates the migration of neutrophils to the area of inflammation. And there are macrophages that reside in the pulmonary parenchyma that are mobilized as well. But in the acute phase of the infection, most of the cells recruited to this area are going to be neutrophils. Now, both neutrophils and macrophages are phagocytes. This means that they ingest pathogens and dispose of them. And this is where virulence is going to come into play. A lot of these respiratory pathogens will resist phagocytosis, they'll destroy antibodies, or they'll otherwise resist or delay being destroyed, which allows these organisms to continue to replicate within your body. So the result of all of this is cellular debris, neutrophils, macrophages, blood cells, bacteria, exudate. All of this will collect in the alveoli of the lung. This results in consolidation of the lung. Now consolidation means that this alveolus has become firm and solid. This is what shows up on the chest x-ray and this is how we know you have pneumonia. So when your alveoli are consolidated that means they're not as compliant. The alveoli are normally very springy and compliant to their process of respiration. But when they're in the consolidative state, they're not as compliant and not capable of facilitating gas exchange with adjacent capillaries. And this is why we'll see patients with developed pneumonia. When we take their vital signs, they'll demonstrate a decreased O2 saturation. They're essentially dealing with dead lung space, which is problematic. Now, before the antibiotic age, Patients would lose entire lobes of their lungs and would die if the cases were complicated. But nowadays we have the technology to identify developing pneumonias and intervene before the disease becomes life-threatening.
So now we know how disease develops. Well, what's the patient going to look like? Where are we going to see when we take their vital signs? Well, the short answer is nothing specific to pneumonia. We may or may not see a fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, or a decreased O2 saturation. But these are still factors you're going to need to take into account because they may give us clues as to the severity of the illness. Now if we've completed our evaluation and if it's determined that after your evaluation that your patient does not have pneumonia, these vitals need to be revisited and reconsidered. You might have some other illness on your differential to consider such as asthma, bronchitis, or even pulmonary embolism if they're presenting with dyspnea, decreased O2 saturation, tachypnea, and tachycardia. Or a combination of conditions. Don't assume that you're always dealing with one illness or condition. So moving on to history and review of systems. Again, nonspecific. You'll typically see a patient that complains of a cough times X many days. Cough is present in about 96% of pneumonia cases. With or without a productive cough, with a full level of energy, or they can say they feel like they're on their last legs. Personally, I've seen pneumonias develop after two days of onset of symptoms or after three weeks of onset of symptoms. The presentation can be highly variable, so don't necessarily infer a diagnosis based simply on the presentation. And moving on to a physical exam, and we're going to want to do an HEE and T cardio and pulmonary exam. Remember that any finding of adventitious breath sounds, be it wheezing, ronchi, or rails, are significant physical exam findings that correlate to obstructive or restrictive pulmonary conditions, but are not specific to any single pulmonary condition. And some healthcare providers are inclined to use the egophony and whispered pectoriloquy testing. And I agree that if you use them, they are helpful in putting together a clinical picture for pneumonia if you suspect pneumonia. Labs. So, sputum cultures are typically not obtained in the outpatient setting. Most pathogens responsible for causing community acquired pneumonia are treated with the same antibiotics, so it's typically not practical to wait on sputum culture results to treat. They're often obtained for educational or epidemiological purposes in outpatient clinics. Now in your hospital settings, you absolutely will be obtaining sputum cultures. I'll typically order a complete blood count, and this is just one more piece to our puzzle. You may or may not see an increase in the white blood cell count, but again, we can't always infer severity of illness by WBC elevation or lack thereof. Personally, I've seen normal WBC counts with profound pneumonia cases and no pneumonia with WBCs in the 20s. Again, this is just one piece of your clinical picture. And now we have imaging. <coughs> so your chest x-ray is as vital to your diagnosis as any other component of your evaluation. You should be getting a two-view chest x-ray because this will guide your treatment plan from here on out. If you or the radiologist can identify consolidation, then your patient has pneumonia. Now it is important to realize that a negative chest x-ray does not rule out pneumonia. So if your clinical suspicion is strong for serious illness yet you have a negative x-ray, 
then by all means refer to pulmonology or the emergency department for further workup. Moving on to treatment. In the U.S., for confirmed pneumonias, we'll usually prescribe macrolides for first-line treatment. And this means azithromycin, clarithromycin. Usually, I've seen azithromycin in my clinical practice. In areas where incidence of antibiotic resistance is higher, such as special populations, so think of colleges, prisons, military installations, Treating with a respiratory quinolone is preferred, like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. If you encounter resistant cases that are not severe enough to require inpatient treatment, usually you'll see treatment plans that include a macrolide plus a beta-lactamase inhibitor like Augmentin. And as far as supportive treatment goes, of course, you can always treat with NSAIDs like acetaminophen and ibuprofen, expectorants, and increased fluid consumption. Some clinicians will go with the decongestant for patient comfort, which is perfectly fine. And incentive spirometers help with inducing coughing which augments our mucociliary apparatus. So they may be helpful as well. And of course, rest. So indications for referral. So there are any number of conditions that you are encounter with pneumonia patients that will prompt referral to inpatient facilities. These are very important to remember. So for one, we have hypoxia. High fever. Progressive dyspnea. Confusion or altered mental status. Shock. If someone's presenting with profound hypotension, then that's important to note. Or unreliable social situation. So if you have a patient whose environment isn't conducive to his or her recovery, then by all means refer to an inpatient facility. You're never wrong for acting in the best interest of the patient. Well, that concludes my video lecture. I hope it was helpful if you listened all the way through. If it was helpful, feel free to leave me a like, or if not, leave a dislike with constructive criticism. This is my first video lecture, so I'm always looking for ways to improve my presentation. If there is demand, I'll try to get more of these out as time permits. So until then, thanks for listening.